My name is Omaru Sanda Amado. My guest, Dr. Zaneto Ajima Rollins. How easy was it for you to win your primaries uh, to be the PC of NDC in Kole Klote? Nothing in Kole, Kole, Klote, Kole is ever easy, it seems. Um, I had uh, my former chairman and uh, the chairman who resigned, a second chairman who resigned to also contest. And um, it, was, it, was, uh, <laughs> it was quite interesting. Mm. But um, ultimately, I think the delegates understood, you know, at least what I'd, I'd actually done. You know, I was able to show them, you know, exactly what work I'd put in so far. And they felt that I would be the person to represent the, uh, the party for the general elections this year. Often when PCs have issues with their executives, mm -hmm. the party tends to lose that constituency. The English Amanfro constituency is one example. In 2016, there was a clash between the member of parliament who was a PC and the executives, and things went haywire. Mm -hmm. In Dom Kwabinyan, we Jack Babi, I beg your pardon, we speak, the executives there are not happy with the candidates who is the guy leading them into the elections. If you have your executives divided against you, and indeed for one to even contest you, that's problematic leading into the election, isn't it? In 2016, 2015 and 2016, the story was pretty much the same. Um, so like I said, it hasn't been easy, mm. uh, but the, the fact is you do your very best, you put in what you can, you try and unite as many sides as possible and the work has to get done, you know, so we just keep moving. I suppose what has been helpful is, um, to date, what I've tried to avoid is fighting fire with fire, let's put it that way, um, because sometimes just for the sake of moving forward, you need to just take the higher road and um, get on with the work, mm. you know, because um, unfortunately, not everybody believes in whatever vision we have moving forward. And um, sometimes, rather than sitting down and sharing the points of view, some choose to go a different way and uh, perhaps try and undermine and sabotage publicly. Mm. But um, by and large, by and large, you know, we have a huge number of executives who are working and are ready and willing to do what we have to do. But to it's a win problem if your executives fall out with you. You would agree because the executives are like the the spirit of the party in the constituency. You are the face of the party. The two of you are supposed to work together. Ideally. Ideally. What but like from, I said... Is it that they don't like your personality? They don't like the ideas you have? What is the problem? If I were to give you a whole catalogue of reasons why we'd be sitting here for a while, mm. um, some of it is inherited, you know. Um, from your former MP? Actually, I was going to say inherited in the sense that there are people who have issues with my father and decided oh. that I would be a good scapegoat. Okay. Um, but um, Did these people work against your candidature in the first place in 2016? Yes. So they were against you from the onset and they still are against you? Yes. But the party members voted for them knowing that there's a friction between the two of you. How does that work? Um, you can't have 100% of everybody's support. You know, you, you get what you have, and hopefully what you have is the majority, in which case what I have been working with so far. And you move forward, and hopefully at some point they'll understand that um, it's in the interest of the party and also for where we're trying to get to for them to come on board. Um, but uh, yes, it is problematic, and it's, it's something that seems to be happening in a few places. Mm. But focus is important. You know, in, in, every, in every situation, you know, I think in football, there's always that one player on the team whose sole objective is to distract the other players by committing fouls, mm. for example. Mm. And um, the person may end up with a yellow card or a red card, but ultimately that's why they're there. Have you made you up know? with this executive, especially the one who contested you, have you made up with them? Are they on your campaign? Um, one of the chairmen, um, who was the former chairman um, in 2016, is actually the, um, the manager of the campaign as okay. we speak. Um, we've actually managed to do a lot of uh, mediation. We've done a lot of uh, bringing of the different sides together. 
Uh, but like I said, you know, you can't have 100%. Mm. But what things. about the one who contested you in the recent primary? Do you have There the were one? two who yeah. contested me, mm -hmm. and I'm saying one of them has okay. been working with me from the very beginning. You, have, you still lost the other one. You've not got him to the table yet. And unfortunately, in spite of attempts from, you know, um, elder members of the party and the party hierarchy to do so, it hasn't happened to date. But we keep working. In 2016, one of the biggest challenges of the MPP in this constituency was that they had their candidate, Philip Addison, and then they had their former chairman, Ninoy. There was a split. Mm -hmm. Many observers think you benefited from the split in the MPP there. Whether it's true or not, mm -hmm. it's inconsequential. But if you're going into 2020 and you also have a seeming split, that may make it a cool job for the MPP, don't you think? I don't think so. But I must say again that um, the, there's a, a faction that started this in 2015, 2016, and it's been ongoing. And um, the good people of Cloti Koli are discerning. They're discerning. And I think that it would be unfair to perhaps de reduce or dim you know, diminish the, the level of discernment that people have. Okay. You know, and um, people can see through what's going on. What was the role of money in your primaries? Um, Perhaps not as extensive as I've seen in some others, but um, it seems to be something that's a general situation um, across board, you know. So, <laughs> some, sometimes I, I, I can't help but wonder, um, not just my primaries, but across board and even in the recent um, NPP primaries, one, one gets a bit concerned because if money is going to be a determining factor in who gets elected to the extent that someone who probably would be able to do a lot more for the people does not get elected because they are less well off or less in, able to perhaps you know distribute gifts and other things where is our democracy heading that is something that is of concern to me where is the democracy that we have heading because then it means that it's up for sale and it means that we may not necessarily have the, the best people in the political space. Did Dr. Zanetta Ajiman Rollins pay anybody to vote for them? For her, sorry. Did she pay anyone to vote for them? Yeah, no. for her. For her? Yeah. No. You didn't? You, were you asked to pay by anybody? I was asked. You I was asked. And you said what? No. I don't believe that that's the way forward. Not even a five CD note? Mm -hmm. You didn't even give that much? If people, if pe okay, let's put it this way. When we've had meetings, for example, when people come for meetings, you need to pay for their transportation. Okay. Is that what is, you call vote buying? No. What would you call vote buying? I suppose vote buying would be when you say to a person, take this money and go and vote for me. Or you're saying, take this money so you don't vote for the other person. Okay. Take this you television know. set. Well, I suppose or that too. Or take this or, motorbike. Uh, yes. You didn't distribute any such thing to delegates. I wasn't, I wasn't that well resourced, but I decided that it wasn't the way to go because um, I was in a situation where people were better resourced than I was and it wasn't, a, it wasn't a competition I could win with money. Really? Yes. Why were you not resourced? Do you uh, you're the daughter of Ghana's longest serving president. I mean, longest serving is in the riches, isn't it? I mean, it? maybe even if it's S. Grasha, if he gives you just one month, I mean, pay, maybe it could, that could match, wouldn't it? The bottom line is this. Um, my, my father does not dish out money for me to give to people okay. for all sorts of things. But ultimately, like I was saying, if it came down to a case of who would pay more, then I certainly had no business winning. So the election was a battle of money versus what? What were you? If you were in money, what were you that you still won? I think uh, perhaps a lot of God's grace, but I had my track record to show for it. And um, on, on checking the, the various candidates, the delegates decided that even some of them who at some point were saying they weren't sure if they, went, they wanted to vote for me, decided that I would be the person who would best be able to hold the seat for the NDC in December So that's a strange kind of politics you're playing, which is like the odd one out. It's, when um, everybody's doing money, you don't want to. You want to be honest and all of that. It's, 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 is it sustainable for you to continue no, to be No, it's money? not. It's difficult. That's, that's why I'm saying it's a big concern because, um, you know, there are demands that come your way. There are demands that come your way that sometimes are just impossible, you know. And the, the difficulty with that is the fact that 
where's the money coming from? You if know, you if you're a holder of public office, mm -hmm. there's a limit to how much money you have. When people are making demands on, they want X amount or Y amount or this or that, beyond a certain point, where's the money coming from? You know, so as, as we allow for more and more of this to happen, we create a situation where it's driving corruption. So you can't point to the uh, politician, the one visible person and say, they are the cause of corruption. We have to look at what are the things that we are doing as a people that encourage certain behaviors. So even if you were in government and you were a minister, for instance, you had all the money, you wouldn't have still used it to buy votes. So it's a principal thing. It's not a lack of funds thing. Which one, I, okay, what prevented you from paying? You didn't have or you wouldn't pay? I didn't feel that it was the way forward because there was the, 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 the monetization thing has gotten out of hand. It has gotten out of hand and it really became a case of how do we move forward by letting people understand that there is a way to do this where we move forward and if there are funds available we use it to support the community mm -hmm. where people need money for their little businesses and things like that mm -hmm. how do we support them with that as opposed to because bear in mind we would close the electoral college again so we have delegates where you have nine per branch representing potentially at least maybe even up to 500 people so for example. easy to bribe um actually what what i was going to say yes i suppose so mm -hmm. but what i was actually going to say is what about the other members who elected these people to represent them if it comes down to a case where the membership the larger membership wants a particular candidate but the the 500. The, the college the college electoral college the electoral doesn't college. want you Yes, then you have a situation where, no, no, what I mean is um, the, 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 the full membership as opposed to the Electoral College. So the population likes you, but the Electoral College, you can't bribe, so they don't vote for you. That's what you're trying to That's say. That's what I'm saying, mm -hmm. exactly. So if you have a situation where the full membership is in support of you, but those who they elected to represent them and vote for people mm -hmm. in the primaries or in branch elections and so on, are actually not doing what it is that the people are asking for, then you have a huge mismatch. Mm. And then you have to wonder how is the democracy translating within mm. the structure? Mm. You know, What do you think the solution should be? Open it up for everybody to vote? I think it has to go beyond that. I think that as a, as a nation, between all the different parties, we have to take a, a, a position on how we want to move forward. Mm. The reason being, when you decide not to do it, someone is going to do it. Mm. Mm. And when you have a situation where a lot of people are living below the poverty line and looking two years into the future is a bit too far, cash in hand. That's what it has to be. It Let's makes a talk difference. about your track record. Hmm. Name five physical things or five maybe intangible things that you did for Kole Klote that makes you deserving of a re-election in 2020. Why should they vote for you again? And now it doesn't matter that they're in this year, MPP. Um, well, for one thing, I've actually conducted myself in a way where I have not been, I have not shown preference to, you know, one person over the other. I have actually been an MP for the entire constituency. Um, recently, I had the, the, the paved, air, the, um, the driveway into the Odona market. Um, covered in gravels because the women there were really suffering with the dust when it was dry mm -hmm. or with the mud when it was rainy and the whole place was dark for a long time they had no lights we um, I, I had written a letter to the ministry um, for energy to get some street lights established all of that we, we zoned out the constituency we've put lights in the market so people don't keep getting robbed and attacked um, there's a bridge in Odona, for example, on the Sahara side, which is the only way for people to escape when there's flooding, which in 2017 was broken, and I repaired that and um, had railings put on the side of that because what happens is when it rains, the flooding is so much that they can't actually see where the concrete is and the, the, the railings are the only way to guide them out of that you know, flooded area. Just in the recent um, June um, 9th flood again, the bridge got destroyed, so just recently we, we did that with the railings to ensure that people can safely escape the, um, the, the flooded area in Sahara. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, there's also a bridge that connects Asylum down to the ridge area, which is a very important commuter route 
for lots of workers and students who are trying to get from, whether it's from the Accra High School or whether it's from work, to and from work. Mm -hmm. And um, it was pretty much a death, a death, a death um, trap. trap. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically it was made up of wooden planks which were very unsteady. Okay. And um, as we speak now, the bridge has been done. We've had it done. Um, we've done the paving area all over that side and put a light so that people who are using the area, whether it's light or dark, they still have that safety mm. of being able to move back and forth. Um, you uh, said a five thing, yeah, so al to allow me to go on, <laughs> okay, please. Continue. Well, and, <laughs> yes, and um, very importantly, has been also supporting the market women, you know, the associations of market women with regards to funding and so on, because sometimes it's difficult for them to get funding to support themselves, um, as well as the students um, every year making sure that they've been supplied with their math sets. And last year, we got um, a young, young Ghanaians who came from uh, um, KNUST who developed these um, science sets and gave them to the school so that the children actually have practical experience of um, doing science as well. As a member of parliament, when you are campaigning, and in fact, when you're going to parliament, your job is to make laws. That's your primary responsibility. But if things you oh, mentioned... Oh, I just remembered one thing. Mm. Okay, go ahead. Add. In Asylum Down, okay. we recently, on just, a, actually yesterday was Sunday. Mm -hmm. On Sunday, I actually was really happy because um, we now have the roads being done in the constituency. Uh, for the last three years, I've been lobbying the, uh, the Minister for um, Roads and Highways, had questions on the floor, written letters and everything, and uh, we finally got the approval for the roads to be done, specific roads in the constituency, which have needed a lot of work. You know, the Odanta Road, for example, in Asylum down the Isefu, we have Akoshi, we have in um, the um, Osu area, we have uh, the Salem um, Avenue, for example, which okay. goes up to the Mandela Park. All these roads which really badly needed to be done. And um, I actually started working on this before the Kole Klote Municipal That's Assembly actually what existed. I was going to go to. So these things you're mentioning, typically shouldn't be the job of an MP. You are a lawmaker. What has been the relationship with the newly created Kole Klote Municipal Assembly, Kokloma, or maybe Kokoma, depends on how you want to look <laughs> at it, and your side? So who is championing development, you or, or the assembly? Because your assembly, funny enough, your municipality is a one constituent municipality. So you're supposed to work hand in hand. How has it been like so far? Well, ideally, it's it's supposed to be the local government in charge of development in the area. Um, we have 11 electoral areas now. And um, <clears throat> I have been working with the municipality. I've sat in on the budgets and everything. And actually, these roads that were given out by the Ministry of Highways were not part of the budget. Um, and it looked like it wasn't going to happen. You know, so it was with a lot of pushing because ultimately as member of parliament, even though my primary job is to be part of the legislature and to make laws and all of that, I also have to ensure that the interest of my constituency and the safety of my constituency is also taken care of, which means that if there are people I need to speak to, you know, if there's lobbying I need to do, questions I need to ask, mm. statements I need to make, you know, all of that, I have the, the capacity to do all of that to ensure that things that need to be done happen. So yes, um, my primary job is to be in Parliament, but I can't ignore the fact that there are pressing issues that affect people's livelihoods and daily lives, which mm -hmm. I must be, you know, taking an interest in. During the COVID era, we saw you in one of the videos. You were very angry. You were not happy with a lot of things. Uh, Paul Adumotri had time to give you a full editorial on TV. What has that been about? Um, at the time, what was happening was we had a lot of um, Kaya who were trapped in Ghana, in, in Accra, mm -hmm. you know, who were unable to leave because of the lockdown. And um, they had no access to the food that we were being told was being distributed. And actually, it was, um, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was uh, Easter Sunday. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. it was a Good Friday. Mm -hmm. It was one of the days, you know, it was Good Friday. It was Good Friday. And, um, you know, I got a desperate call that the Kaye in the markets had not been given any food. And 
it, it was so heartbreaking actually um, to get there. These women were there with their children, with no food being given. And um, I think what really, what made me so sad was the fact that we'd done the, you, we, we'd asked questions around, we'd actually received, you know, complaints about the fact that some people were being excluded from the food distribution, which was very unfortunate. And it just seemed unconscionable and it would have been wrong of me to not point out that this was happening and I'm glad that um, following that you know some action was taken in terms of you know perhaps greater awareness being brought to the issue because after that a lot of other people came on you know came on TV and in the media to actually confirm a lot of what I'd said. The controversy around that was mm -hmm. that the politicization of the food distribution yes which end you, and I'm not sure if end is the right word, mm. an editorial on Good Evening Ghana. What do you make of that? You know, I think we need to start looking about the issue of um, violence against women in politics more seriously. There are a lot of things that happen to women in public office which happen simply because they're women. You know, there are certain ways in which women are spoken about in a denigrating and demeaning manner which men don't have to go through and I think it's something we need to look at you think as Paul said those things to you because you were a woman I think I'll let you uh, read between the lines of what I've said because clearly there are certain tones and certain things that one would not say so one has to ask is it about a woman being a fair target for certain things you but know if, because if we have um, we have uh, I, I, I'd rather not you know have this debate on what somebody was thinking mm. when they were saying what they were saying what I can say is the issue of violence against women in politics is real. And it's not about being physically assaulted. It's also about the way in which women are addressed or demeaned, you know, publicly, which we need to look at. If we really, as a nation, really, genuinely, sincerely want to have women in leadership, if we really want women to be in the political space, if we want really qualified women who have built up their reputations to want to take public office, then we need to look at how we allow women to be treated in the public space. You felt that editorial was violence against your person. Are you trying to get me to say it in a different way? Um, I think I've said what I've said because um, clearly it was. And I think the, the, the public response or the outcry to a lot of what happened spoke for itself. This is face to face on City TV. Um, Dr. Zanetta Jimaro 